Good evening and welcome everyone watching tonight on YouTube, Facebook, and GoToWebinar. This is episode number 101 of Orbird Tube, and tonight author Steve Snyder will take us on a European tour of some of the places mentioned in his book, Shot Down. Now, before we get started, please do us a favor if you haven't already done so. I know many of you have, but uh, if you're new here, uh, just uh, go ahead and, and uh, do us a favor and just click that uh, like or subscribe button. And if you're following us on YouTube, click the bell icon and you will get uh, notifications whenever we go live. All right, so uh, we are glad to have you here. If you have any questions that uh, pop into your into your mind as you're listening to uh, Steve's presentation this evening, just go ahead and type them into the comments section of whatever social media platform you're on, and we'll uh, either try to get those answered during the presentation or we'll save some time at the end uh, to answer all those questions. So joining me now from uh, California, where it's uh, probably one of the nicest places in the country, <laughs> the rest of the country is... is uh, Deep in winter, and but uh, Steve, you're you're still doing okay out there in in uh, sunny California, and uh, welcome to the show, and uh, glad to have you here. Well, thank you very much, Steve. I'm glad to be here again. Yeah, it is nice, uh, blue sky and sunny, and uh, it's uh, five o'clock here, so it's about <laughs> 63 degrees. It was a little warmer than that earlier today, so I don't want to make anyone feel bad, but <laughs> good place to be. That's right. So, uh, Steve, now, uh, for those of you who are regulars on uh, Warbird Tube, you know Steve has been a guest before, and, and he's written a wonderful book called uh, Shotdown. If you haven't read it, I don't know what you're waiting for. Uh, you need to go uh, go out to Amazon and, and pick it up. And it, it's the, the story of uh, Steve's dad and the crew of the Susan Ruth, uh, B-17 crew, uh, and their uh, missions uh, during World War II. They end up getting shot down, and um, the crew has they just separated and has lots of uh, adventures. And uh, Steve has documented everything in the book. But tonight, Steve, you're going to do something a little different. Tell us what we're going to see. Yes, I am. I am so fortunate and so blessed to know so much of my dad and his crew. And that's why I wrote the book, uh, Shot Down. And uh, not only do I know so much about my dad and his crew, but I know all the Belgian people that were involved in their stories. And I've been to all the places or many of the locations where the events took place. And that's what I want to share with you today. And I'm going to share a lot of information, uh, which only doesn't even scratch the surface of the details that are in the book. Um, the first half of the book builds up to the day that the plane was shot down. And then the second half of the book is all about what happened afterwards. And that's where I'm going to start. Uh, this is my dad's crew. Um, you see the four officers in front there. My dad's on the lower left. He was the first pilot and going across. It's George Ike, the co-pilot, Robert Benninger, the navigator, and then Richard Daniels, the bombardier. And then you have the uh, six enlisted men or gunners going across the top. Uh, can everyone see that full screen? Because I I want to because I'm I have uh, Steve and myself yep. on the top there so I wanted to make sure that everyone could see that okay yes yes we can okay great thank you. thank you very much well it was on uh, February 8th of 1944 where the B-17 Susan Ruth which was named after my oldest sister who was one year old at the time my dad went overseas and 20 other B-17s of the 306 bomb group. Uh, took off from the base at Thurlie, England. Uh, Thurlie was about 60 miles north and a little bit west of London. And the mission was to bomb the uh, railroad marshalling yards at Frankfurt, Germany. And they dropped their bombs successfully, but their bomb bay doors got hit by flak uh, and they couldn't get them back up. And as a result, that caused, caused a drag on the plane. They lost airspeed and they fell behind the formation going back to England. And they were singled out by two German Focke-Wolf fighters who came in for the kill and shot the Susan Ruth down. But both those Focke-Wolf fighters were shot down at the same time. One was piloted by Siegfried Merrick and his plane crashed in this field and he was killed in the plane. But you can visit his grave at the Lamel German War Cemetery in Belgium. And you can see a lot of the parts of his plane that are on display in a little museum in Mons uh, Mansu Belgium. Uh, it was an old cow shed. It's two stories now, and it looks pretty small, but it's amazing how many artifacts and memorabilia is contained in that little museum. 
And uh, three of the larger pieces of uh, Siegfried Merritt's plane are in there. This is the one of the propeller blade. Then you have the propeller hub, crankshaft. And there's also a lot of memorabilia from my dad's crew, the, the, the Susan Ruth. My dad donated his Eisenhower jacket there. And only about 100 yards away is a memorial to the first 12 GIs that were killed in the liberation of Belgium on September 2nd of 1944. Uh, they were involved in a skirmish with the Waffen-SS 2nd Panzer Division Das Reich. And this memorial was erected in 1988. You, you see a, a star there uh, representing the U.S. Army, and that's sitting on top of an uh, outline of the map of Belgium. And then you have 12 headstones in the back representing the 12 men who were killed. That's not where they're buried. And then you have seven flags in back for representing the countries that were occupied by the Nazis. And then three countries, uh, the US, Canada, and, and Britain, which liberated those countries. Uh, the other uh, Luftwaffe pilot that shot down my dad's plane was Hans Berger. And I found Hans Berger when I was doing my research and fortunately for me, he became a translator after the war and speaks perfect English. And he gave me some wonderful insight that's in the book about what it was like to go against the 8th Air Force. He was shot down in this field in Belgium, but then he got back into uh, to action and uh, continued combat after that. I've been to Munich, Germany twice to visit Hans and we become friends. Here he's wearing his fighter jacket with his uh, iron cross uh, on there. I don't know if you can see that too well. And uh, Hans shot down seven B-17s, uh, one Spitfire, but he was shot down three times himself. All his friends were killed during the war. I think the only reason Hans made it through the war is that in the beginning of 1945, he was pulled out of combat, combat and made a test pilot for the Henke HE 162 single engine jet fighter that the Nazis were trying to perfect, which they never did. Uh, interestingly enough, Hans, of all the people that I'm going to show you in the shot down story, Hans is the only one that's still living. He'll be 100 years old this October. And when I visited Hans, he, he, he had a, a bunch of memorabilia to show me. He had a, a photo album that was just incredible that I don't have time to show you tonight, but amazing pictures. But this is Hans's flight log that he kept during the war. And he showed me here, he opened it up. And on February 8th, I don't have a cursor here to, to point out, but he showed his entry on February 8th of 1944, where he shot down a B-17 and he was shot down. So uh, it was just wonderful getting to know Hans and uh, hearing his stories. The Susan Ruth, uh, my dad put it on the co-pilot after he bailed out and it kind of, uh, by eyewitness account, circled down and it came down in the little village of Mackinwaz, just north of the French border on the property of the distillery farm. And this is what the distillery farm looked back then. Uh, this is what it looks like today. And in 1989, a memorial was erected to my dad and his crew, just catty corner to the farmhouse there. And prior to that, my dad didn't talk too much about the war, like most World War II veterans. But my dad and three other, me three other members of his crew that were still living went over for the dedication of the memorial. And there he was reunited with all these Belgium people that hit him during the war and saw these places where he was hidden and that brought it all back and he started talking about it afterwards. My first visit was to Belgium. I've been there six times. Uh, but my first time was in 1994 with my parents and that's when it became personal for me because I saw all these places that I'm gonna show you firsthand. Uh, this is a closer look at the memorial. It has a, two plaques on the front that has the names of the crew, uh, their positions on the plane and their uh, ages at the time they were shot down. Uh, of my dad's 10-man crew, uh, two of the crew were killed uh, during the attack by the Falk Wolf 190s. On the left, you have Ro uh, Ross Kaler, who was the radio operator. And on the right, you have Lewis Colwert, who was the ball turret gunner. And when my dad's plane came down, it was circling, and, and the tail broke off the plane, and these 
two men's bodies were thrown out. And these are pictures of their bodies laying on the field across from the farmhouse that day. Uh, Ross Kaler's body was brought back to the US and he's buried in his hometown of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. You're in the, I'm, I'm rooting for the Eagles this year in the Super Bowl. And, uh, but uh, Louis Colwert's uh, grave is at the Ardennes American Cemetery in Belgium that you can visit. Through other crew members of the plane, uh, they were picked up right away by the Germans and became prisoners of war. In the middle there, you see uh, Richard Daniels, the bombardier. Uh, he was picked up right away and he, he was spent his in the, the entire rest of the war, the remainder of the war as a POW, he was installed at IV. He was involved in the, the infamous Heidekrug run and also uh, suffered through the 500 mile, 86 day black march uh, from the Baltic Sea back into Germany because the Germans were bringing the, the prisoners uh, to avoid the, the Russians coming in. The other two guys that uh, bailed out and were picked up and became POWs on, on the left there is Richard Daniels, the bombardier, and on the right is uh, Joe Musial. Uh, you could, that picture of him, you see the palm trees in the back. He was actually stationed in the Pacific at the beginning of the war. That picture was taken at Hickam Field, and he was there when Pearl Harbor was bombed by the Japanese. And he flew 72 missions in the Pacific before he came back home and volunteered to go to the European Theater of Operations. All my dad's crew was injured to one degree to another, but Richard Daniels and Joe Musial were by far the most seriously injured. Richard Daniels had a 20 millimeter shell go through his right bicep and tear it off and then exit through his shoulder. Joe Musial had his left foot basically severed. It was just hangling uh, from his leg by two tendons. Because of the seriousness of their, of their injuries, uh, they were taken to the medical clinic of Dr. Andre Trego in Chimay, Belgium, where Richard Daniels' uh, arm was almost severed, amputated. They did amputate Joe Musial's foot. And then when they were stabilized, they sent him to a hospital prison, a Luftwaffe hospital prison in St. Gilles prison outside of Brussels. This is what the prison looked like back then. This is what it looked like today. And then from there, um, actual Joe, Joe Musial ended up being sent to Sonic Le Four, where, where uh, Holbert was. And he was totally shocked when he it encountered Holbert because Holbert's black hair turned completely white. Uh, Richard Daniels was, was sent to uh, just many uh, German hospital prisons uh, because of the serious and his wounds. They could, he got infected and they always had problems. And eventually, both Daniels and Musial were repatriated back to the United States in early of 19, uh, in February of 1944, because of their serious of, of seriousness of their injuries. They were shipped on the SS Ripsholm, which was a Swedish, Swedish cruise ship, which was being operated by the Red Cross. Here you have two other members of my dad's crew. On the left is George Ike, the co-pilot. And on the right is Robert Benninger, the navigator. And they came down uh, very close to each other and they were picked up by the resistance, the French resistance. And they were taken to the home of Esther and Valerie uh, Fossett in Reyes, Reyes, Belgium. They only stayed there a short time and then they were moved to a resistance camp. Uh, this is, uh, was a fairly large camp. This is one of the structures uh, there, uh, that's no longer there. You can't visit that today. But there they met up with uh, five other downed U.S. airmen, uh, five members of the 306 bomb group Ration Passion. And um, uh, Billy Hewish, uh, excuse me, from the uh, 91st bomb group, Stunk, Skunk Face. 
And there they, they stayed. There were uh, resistance fighters. Uh, resistance fighters had been injured. They were local uh, Belgian men. They were hiding from the Germans because they were going to be sent to labor camps in Germany. Uh, guys that had been captured by the Germans and went to prison camps but escaped. But on February 28th of 1944, the Germans raided that camp because some Belgium collaborated and ratted them out. And they all just scattered after that. But the U.S. airmen were taken to uh, another location, to this cabin in the Plumont Woods, which is right out of Chimay, Belgium. That's what the cabin looked like back then. This is what it looks like today that you can go visit. And uh, they only stayed there for a short time there because it was very close to Chimay, where the local Gestapo headquarters was located. And also a German garrison had taken off over the schoolhouse there in Chimay. So it was too dangerous for them to stay there any longer. So a couple members of the Belgium underground, Florent uh, Simon and Fernand uh, Fontaine, moved him further away in the woods of Chimay, Belgium. Actually, it's called the Champagne Woods, where they erected a, a hut. And this is the location of the hut. These four stones outlines where the hut was. And this is what the hut looked like. Uh, on the right hand side, you could see it was buried in the ground and the roof of the hut actually touched uh, ground level. And there it had one opening uh, door to the south and then there was a long bed along one wall of the, of the hut and the, and the table in the hut. And then on that little structure on the right, you see that that was a latrine that was about 120 feet, 30 yards away. And we know what the hut looked like because one of the men that was staying there, Warren Cole, who was the, from the 306 Ration Passion, uh, described it uh, to uh, a local Belgium, and Belgium man that he went to visit. And there they just hunkered down and they were waiting to get into escape networks. Uh, there were various escape networks uh, where the air down there would get in down through France, over the, Pyrene over the Pyrenees, into Spain and then out through British controlled Gibraltar. But they had trouble getting into these networks. And finally, Warren Cole and another member of the Ration Passion Iron Glaze, uh, they got fed up with hiding and they just took off on their own. And uh, miraculously, uh, they met up with the right people and they made it back to England. So now there were six men uh, hiding in the woods in that hut. And Florence Simon, who uh, I mentioned, uh, this is his family. They lived in a farmhouse nearby. Uh, to the right is his daughter, Fernandi, and then his wife, Jean, holding Fernandi's daughter. And you have uh, Fernand, or Florence Simone, his son, Joseph, and then Fernandi's husband, Jules Bouet. And this is their farmhouse. I've been in that farmhouse, actually visited with the uh, people that live there today. And I learned that uh, the Simones also in that farmhouse hit a Jewish couple for a while, but they finally got too scared of uh, and frightened of staying there and they took off. But unfortunately they were captured by the Germans and shot and, and murdered. Uh, another place you can visit is Jules Bouet House, which is just up the road. And Jean uh, Simon, she cooked for the guys hiding in the hut. She washed their clothes. And Florence Simone would travel up this road. It's called the Hill of Cows Road, um, back into those woods where, where the hut was. And he rode a bicycle. And he had two milk pails on each side of his bike. And he would hide you know, the food or the clean clothes going up to the hut. And then on the far right side of that picture, you can see the farmhouse of uh, Albert Minet. Here's a picture of Albert Minet, and a little closer picture of the farmhouse. And he also supplied food uh, for those guys hiding in the hut. You have to remember that there's six guys hiding in this hut at the time, and they're you know late teens, early twenties, and they're really they can put away a lot of food. And it was uh, difficult to keep these guys fed. 
And then this is a pathway to the hut, the hut. after Flamo, uh, Florence Simone would go up the Hill of Cows Road, he'd turn off on a pathway. Uh, this is what it looks like today. It was all camouflaged at the time. Uh, it's been cleared now, but as you can see, oh, well, there I got my little cursor back. This American flag that's on certain trees now and then so you can walk into to the hut. Here's another member of my dad's crew, John Pindruck. He was the right waist gunner. When he came down, the French resistance picked him up and they took him to the farmhouse of uh, George and Nellie Dershom. This is George Dershom and this is their, their farmhouse. Uh, since the war, it's, uh, Chimay has been built up uh, quite a bit by then. So it's actually part of the town. It's not a, a really a farm anymore, but that's where he stayed. John Pindrock was only 19 years old, and so he was scared to death, and uh, he, uh, and he was very lonely. He wanted to join his buddies back hiding in the hut. Uh, Nellie and uh, George tried to talk him out of it, saying it was safe, safer just to stay there, but uh, he wanted to get back to his buddies on, on the crew uh, so he could just get into these escape networks when they finally got out, and he was afraid about uh, of being left behind. So he did join them the, at the hut, as well as another down in US uh, airman. And this is Vincent Reese from the 306 uh, bomb group and the B-17 woman's home companion. So now you had eight men hiding in the hut. Unfortunately, on February 22nd of 1944, a Belgium collaborator had told the Germans, the Nazis, what was going on. And uh, a, a 1,500 men that was made up of various Nazi and, and German military units, uh, police units, descended on the area, and they attacked three locations. One was the farmhouse of the S Simone family, where Jean Simone and her son, Joseph were captured. The other location was the Manet farm where Albert Manet was captured. And the other location was the hut where these eight men were hiding. Also hiding there was Henri Fontaine, the son of Fernand Fontaine, who was the warden of the forest who helped build the hut. Uh, he was wanted by the Nazis to be sent to a labor camp in Germany, and that's why he was hiding out uh, with the other eight men, eight airmen, so he wouldn't be discovered. Also at the hut that day was Florence Simon, but fortunately for him, right before the Germans got there, he had to go to the latrine, and so he was further out in, in the woods, and he wasn't captured. Although he saw what was going on, heard gunshots, and was actually fired upon himself, but he fled across the French border, and uh, he stayed there until early September when the U.S. armies came up after D-Day and, and liberated the area. All the people that were arrested were taken to the schoolhouse in Chimay, Belgium, where that the German garrison was. This is what the schoolhouse looked back then. This is what it looks like today. It's, it really hasn't changed at all. In one of the upper classrooms is this writing on the wall in German, which says, today, the German soldier with his active participation will determine the fate of Europe. And I get chills just saying that. But the Belgian people left that on there uh, to remember what took place. They didn't want to erase that. After being interrogated, these eight airmen were taken back out in the woods to the pathway, going to the hut. They were marched uh, a few hundred yards in, and then they were taken in different directions, followed by two Germans who, after a period of, 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 of a period of time, shot all eight of them in the back twice and murdered them. Uh, today, there's a sign at the pathway that leads to the hut that says, Pathway of Remembrance. And then at the location where they split these men off, uh, there's a memorial um, that says, uh, 
They sacrifice their youth and their lives to preserve our freedom. And their names are on that plaque. And now they've also uh, kind of roped off the area of the hut and have a little plaque there to uh, memorialize what took place. Uh, also who were arrested were Joseph Simone and Henri Fontaine. As I mentioned, Henri was arrested at the hut. Joseph was arrested at the, the Simon farm. And they were both sent to concentration camps, various concentration camps in Germany. And I don't know, ironically or, or not, uh, Joseph was working on a uh, labor detail trying to repair uh, some railroad lines in Germany. And there was attacked by German, uh, US bombers and he was killed in that bombing attack. And Henri Franken uh, went to various, I mean, Henri uh, Fontaine went to various prisoner of war camps in Germany and, and just disappeared, never to be heard from again. This is the, the grave of the Simone family. Uh, after the war, Joseph Simone's body was brought back and he and both his parents are buried there that you can visit. After the war, his mother Jean was so distraught, could just never get over losing her son. And she never stopped blaming her husband, Florent, for getting him involved on the underground and harped on him eternally. And finally, Florent could not take his guilt anymore and he hung himself, a casualty of the war. Four of the men of the eight men that were uh, murdered, they're still in Europe. You can go visit their graves at the Netherlands American Cemetery in Margraten. On the left there is John Pendrock from my dad's crew. On the right is John Gamborski from the Ration Passion. And then on the in this slide, Billy Hewish from the Skunk Face and Vincent Reese from the Woman's Home Companion. Uh, the last two crew members of my dad's crew, uh, I have, have happier stories, I'm, I'm glad to say. Uh, this is the tail gunner, Bill Schlenker. And my dad and the plane came down in Belgium, but the, all the other eight guys that bailed out came down in France. And, and Bill came down in France at uh, the Signe Le Petit. And he was taken to the farmhouse of Marie Louis Auger. This is Marie with her fiance at the time. Uh, he was in the French army and was captured uh, in 1940 and spent the remainder of the war as a POW. But fortunately, he made it through the war and they were, they were married and had a happy life. This is the farmhouse uh, where, uh, of uh, Marie's and where Schlenker stayed. And the farmhouse now belongs to uh, the granddaughter of Marie. This is uh, Virginie uh, with, on the right there, is the grandson of Bill Schlinker, Brian Schlinker. And we, when we visited there, we went down in the basement where Bill was hidden. And you can see his grandson, uh, Brian, there in the basement. Schlenker was injured, though. He had some shrapnel wounds in his foot and it needed medical atten attention. So the resistance brought him back over into Belgium into Dr. Trudeau's uh, medical clinic. And although it was controlled by the Germans, they snuck him in the back door and they fluoroscoped his, uh, his foot. And uh, then he was taken to uh, a nearby house of Jophine uh, Collet, who was just a couple blocks, a few blocks away from the medical clinic. And there he stayed for seven months until he was finally liberated uh, by the U.S. armies. This is Josephine. Uh, she had two daughters, uh, Giselle, 27 on the, on the left, and Paula, uh, who was 20 years old on the right. Uh, Schlenker celebrated his 20th birthday there. It has been said that Paula on the right kind of took a liking to, to Brian when he was finally liberated on the left, that uh, she was pretty disappointed. <laughs> Uh, here you see the the Calais home uh, with jo uh, Giselle and and Paula uh, on the balcony, 
that's what it looked like then. This is what it looks like today. It's this whole structure. And the Calais was, were uh, fairly wealthy. Uh, Mr. Calais was a, was a merchant. And right when the Germans invaded, uh, he, he decided to use all his money to buy goods, merchandise, because they didn't think the French franc would be worth anything. So he bought coffee and, and liquor and wine and tobacco and flour and, and other goods, which he thought he could trade uh, better than using money. But unfortunately, the Germans came in and confiscated everything he had. And he was so despondent, he hung himself. Another casualty of the war. Down the street lived Fernand del Port, AKA Albert, who was the district leader of the underground, the resistance. Uh, this was his home. Also nearby was the Gestapo headquarters, just was a few blocks away. And this is the building that the Gestapo headquarters uh, was in. It's a little restaurant today that I've, I've eaten in. And finally, you have my dad, uh, pilot Howard Snyder. Uh, he was the last crewman to bail out and he came down in these trees right at the French-Belgium border. And his parachute got hung up to these branches and he was dangling 20 feet off the ground and couldn't get down. But fortunately for him, a couple young Belgian men, Henri Franken and Raymond Dervan, came to his rescue before the Germans got to him. This happened uh, early afternoon. Uh, they got a ladder from the, from the farm and a rope helped them down this tree. That's uh, Henri Franken standing next to the tree. Uh, as you can tell, there's lots of pictures from Belgium and there's over 200 time pictures in the book so you can visualize everything you're reading about. Uh, Henri sent this to my dad after the war, but this was the tree they helped him come down. Uh, they told him to stay put and hide because they thought it was too dangerous to try to move him in daylight with these German patrols combing the area. But that night they came back and got him and they took him to the Durvan farmhouse. This is what it looks like or looked like back then. Here you see the Durvan family. Uh, on the left there is uh, Ida Durvan, uh, Raymond's uh, mother. And then on the right hand side, you see uh, his, his, his dad. And then Raymond Durvan is down to the lower left, uh, to the left of those young children. Uh, the young woman there is, is his sister and her husband, and that's her two children. And he stayed there one night because they thought it was too dangerous to stay them any longer than that with these German patrols in the area. So the next night at Belgium, let me, that's what it looks like today. Uh, this is what it looked like then. That's what it looks like today. You can see there's been a little remodeling on it. And then this is what the house looks like from a distance. And it's right at the French-Belgium border because that house is in Belgium, but those trees are in France. But the next night, a Belgium customs officer, Paul Tilcan, uh, came in a tandem bicycle to take him to a safer location. He first took him to the uh, Tilcan house, which also acted as the customs office. But this is what it looked like today. It's on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, uh, across the road from that, is the Franken farmhouse, Henri Franken's farmhouse. Uh, this is what it looks like today. They've took it really doesn't, it's not the same house. They've torn it down. But my dad, uh, when they came to the house, he put a Belgium customs officer's uniform, a spare uniform on my dad, put a little pillbox on his head, uh, wore a cape, and they head out to go to a safer location. And they pedaled up this hill, and uh, it was the middle of the night, kind of rainy, and they couldn't pedal it up any more, so they started pushing the bike up the hill, and they came to a cabaret, uh, which was in this building here, which is on the right side of the building, the left side of the building that's been added on to since the war. But the lights were on, people were laughing, loud talking, music was playing, and a couple of German officers come walking out that door with these two young French girls, and one of them comes up to my dad, puts an arm around him and asks for a cigarette for his light, for a light for a cigarette. My dad, he was petrified. He couldn't speak German, couldn't speak French at the time. But fortunately, Paul knew what they wanted. So he lit their cigarette and the 
the Germans let them go on their way. My dad said they were too drunk and too interested in these young girls to pay much attention to a couple of Belgium customs officers pushing a bike up in the middle of the road. So then they took him into Chimay uh, to Dr. Soye's, uh, the bailiff's house. He didn't stay there long because, again, because of the Gestapo headquarters being there and that German garrison being there, they thought it was too dangerous. So they moved him uh, about 50 miles north to the town of Charleroi, which was much larger and further away, so it was safer. And they stayed there for a lengthy period of time, staying with several people. Uh, this is Charles Soutier. Uh, they stayed at his house there in Charleroi. And then he went to stay with uh, Eva Martin. This is Eva and her husband, Jack Martin, on the left. Jack was actually a captain in the British Army during World War I, and that's when he went Eva, and they got married and lived in Belgium. And when the Germans uh, first invaded the area, they tried to get back to England, but before they could make it, uh, they were caught by the Germans, and Jack was sent to uh, concentration camps where they did medical experiments on him. And after the war, he was sent back uh, to England to try to recover for several months but he never really could, and those medical experiences uh, caused him to develop cancer, and he died in 1952, not that long after the war ended. Uh, Eva lived with her young daughters uh, while my dad was there, Jacqueline and Maggie, and uh, this is the house they lived in uh, that I've been to, and I am now friends with uh, Eva Martin's grandson. This is Jean-Paul Godry to the right, his, his wife in the middle, and that's their daughter, Anne Sophie. And uh, we become like family. Uh, two of the people my dad stayed with for lengthy periods of time on the left is Ghislaine Bayou, and on the right is uh, Madame Gaden, Jeanette Gaden. Actually, her husband was a captain in the F French army, and he was also captured in 1940, and he spent the remainder of the war as the POW, but he made it back safely too. And my dad became friends with them and uh, met with them after the war several times. Uh, this is Maurice, Maurice Bayou, uh, just Lane's husband. This is their house. And my, when my dad was staying there, he wrote this diary about his plane being shot down it's absolutely riveting uh, It's in the book. And one of the times that I visited that house, uh, we were out front taking some pictures. And in the upper left-hand window, uh, the owner of the house opened it up and uh, yelled out, he could speak English, may I help you? Uh, and I go, yeah, my dad was hidden in this house. So he was probably interested and he came down and I uh, had a bunch of pictures with me that were taken at that house. And I st started showing him pictures and I showed him this one of my dad inside the house and he goes oh my goodness that wall covering is still there today over 70 years later <laughs> and so we went inside the house and he showed me and then i tried to pose like my dad but i didn't really do a very good job of it but there you see that same wall covering that's there today well now you know 79 years later this is the back of the house of the little patio and it looks just like that today on the right hand side is, maybe Ga is Mimi Gabriel that lived next door. She was 16 years old and she could speak English and she taught my dad how to speak conversational French. They would play uh, Monopoly cards and so forth to help him learn. And then you see my dad, they put him, he always wore a beret trying to fit in with the locals even though he was so much taller than the locals. And this, that's Gisine, uh, Giselle, Giselle, uh, Bayou next to him, and then that's uh, Mimi Gabriel's mother on the right. And then this is the house they lived in that was right next, next door. A uh, last uh, couple that I'll show you that they lived with in Charleroi was Victor and Amy Cools. This was a picture they sent to him after the war, and there you can see on their credenza is a picture of my dad that he sent to him. Uh, it was very stressful for my dad, uh, hiding for months from the Germans. He had several close calls, almost being captured. And finally, word came that the uh, Allies landed at Normandy on June 6th, and he decided to get back and fight. 
get back, at, get back into the fight and join the French resistance. Uh, Amy and Victor tried to vehemently to talk him out of it because it was way too dangerous, but he was not to be deterred. And so he talked, uh, this is their house, excuse me, uh, there in Charlevoix. But he convinced my dad to escort her uh, down in, uh, to the French border to join up with the resistance. Uh, they rode bicycles down to the border. And uh, Amy took him to the farmhouse of Henri Franken that I mentioned earlier, but helped him down from the trees. And he, this is uh, Henri Franken's mother here and uh, his little brother standing in the doorway. And then that arrow points to the room where my dad stayed. That's what it looked like back then. This is what it looks like today. Uh, those windows to the right have been added on since then. And this is the room where my dad stayed. And it's pretty small, as you can see by me standing in it, that I could reach out and touch both sides of the wall. And then finally, my dad uh, went across the border. Uh, the French resistance was satisfi satisfied that uh, he was a downed airman. And uh, he joined uh, the French resistance, the Mackie. This wasn't the group that he joined with, but I just show you that as kind of an example of what they look like. The Mackie was uh, independent ragtag guerrilla groups located all across France. And this is uh, the farmhouse that they stayed in uh, just across the border in France, Wallers, France. And this is a little closer up look. That was a picture I took of my dad in 1994 when we visited uh, together. And he stayed in this tower in these two, uh, where you see these two windows. And on one occasion, it was just early morning, he had shaving cream in his force. He's just, uh, just in his skivvies and he sees a German patrol coming up uh, the road because he had a great view of that road down below. So he had to jump out of the, these grain kind of compartments up here, not really silos, and then hightail it into the woods to avoid being captured. And to uh, enter this building, you had to go. You have to go in on the right-hand side and walk a little bit, and then you go up. I don't know if my cursor is working here. I don't see. Can't to get it work. But you walk up a ladder to the second level where those uh, open windows are. And there's all this grain piled up that you have to wade through the grain uh, to the left side, and then you get it. Walk up a little ladder to go up the second floor to get in that tower room, and uh, it just trying to get in that tower room for me, who's 70 plus years older, was, was a challenge. Uh, but here you see me, and then the green is my son, Clayton, and then the other gentleman was, was the uh, owner of, of the farm in that little room where my dad stayed with the French resistance. And on the right, you see that window he looked out uh, to see the German patrol coming up the area. And then I looked out the, the back of there, you know, to see what it must have looked like to, to jump out of there, which I, I wouldn't want to do. But uh, it's just amazing to be in these places where that, uh, all this took place. Finally, seven months after my dad bailed out, word came that there was U.S. troops in the nearby village of Trelone, France. So my dad walked in the village of Trelone. This is the, the town square went up to an army major, actually it was an element of Patton's Third Army, which had come up through France after D-Day, identified himself. Uh, he caught a ride on a convoy taking German prisoners to Paris, uh, and then got a transport to make it back to England. But while in Paris, he sent a telegram to, uh, to my mother, uh, letting her know uh, that it reads, is that sweet little chin still up, baby? Black it, back at base, fit as fiddle. Will Wright banked the money, love, because he had all that back pay coming from all that time that he was missing in action. And then uh, he didn't stay very long in, uh, at, his, at his base. Uh, the U.S. Air Force had a rule at the time that if you were shot down over occupied territory and helped by the resistance, that you could not go back in combat because they were shot down a, a second time and captured by the Germans and tortured that you give up the identity of the people that were sh that, that helped you the first time. The only exception to that uh, rule that I know was Chuck, Le Chuck Yeager, Chuck, yep. who personally met with Eisenhower to talk him back into going into combat. So my dad was sent back home and he was reunited with his wife, Ruth. Little Susan was two months old now, and he met his little five-month-old baby Nancy that was born while he was missing in action. So this was the first time that he met her. 
My dad uh, kept a few mementos from fight, fighting with the resistance. Uh, here is the uh, armband that he wore while he was fighting with the resistance. That the, that's the cross of Lorraine, which was the symbol, uh, symbol of the resistance during the war. Uh, he's now donated that armband to that little museum there in Mansu, M. Uh This is a Spanish uh, llama pistol that he uh, fought with uh, while he was with the resistance. And this is a Waffen SS uh, belt that he took off a German tank sergeant when he was f fighting with the resistance. Obviously, all these are, are, are treasures, but now I have a new treasure. I have a little six month year old grandson named after my father and his father, grandfather, Howard Snyder. So that's the story of my dad and his crew. Uh, thank you very much for uh, tuning in. And if anyone have any, has any questions, I'd be glad to answer. Exactly. Yes. Um, <laughs> what that is, a, that is a cute little baby there. Um, it, you know, I'm I'm always struck um, not only talking to you, but with with others uh, who recount some of the stories of the, uh, the people in, in occupied countries, Belgium, France, that went out of their way to uh, help American, especially downed airmen, uh, either hide them from the from the Gestapo or the and the Nazis, or to help repatriate them, and get them back to England. Um, there there just seems to be a great sense even today of history. Uh, in those European countries that were were such a part of the uh, the conflict, and, and do you get that feeling when when you're visiting those those spots as well? Oh, absolutely. My, my dad was. Uh, they, he said, you know, they saved his life. Mm -hmm. uh, they gave him uh, their bed to sleep in. They'll sl they'd sleep on the floor or someplace else. They'd give him the majority of the food. The food would be that rationed at that time, so it was hard to come by. I mean, he he was so grateful to them and he kept in touch with uh, many of his helpers until the day they died. Uh, they would correspond, uh, write Christmas card to one another and he did go visit them. Uh, there was a special bond. And, and like you say, the Belgian people today are so grateful and so thankful for the Americans and for the allies of liberating them from four years of Nazi occupation and Nazi oppression. We in the US just can't imagine and comprehend what it was like for four years to have your freedom away and just be totally oppressed. But they in, in the in the Be Belgium, the Netherlands, and northern France do. And they do a great job of, of remembering and educating the younger people. Uh, they've erected a number of memorials in the area. I showed you the one they erected to my dad and their crew. And on the anniversary dates of those memorials, they have they have special ceremonies and this Coming Saturday, uh, well, no, next week, uh, September 11th, actually, they'll have a memorial to my, at my dad's, they'll have a ceremony at my dad's memorial. Uh, the big the celebrations are always on September 2nd or around September 2nd, uh, the liberation of Belgium, where there are fabulous events where uh, I've been to and many of my dad's uh, relatives of my dad's crew have been to and they last several days and they're wonderful events uh there's lots of beer drinking but there's a lots of you know serious ceremonies at the memorials and yeah those people uh just cannot be thankful enough i i it, it's amazing i've developed some lifelong uh friends there from going to this these reunions and these celebrations you mentioned early on that uh, until uh, your dad revisited uh, some of these spots, I think, in 1994. He really didn't talk much about uh, his his time uh, in, in the war. But was he also, was he still corresponding uh, with, with some of the, the, the people who helped him in Belgium, even though he wasn't maybe talking to his family ab about what had happened, but was he still connected uh, overseas? Yes. And, uh, you know, I... At the time where you're young and you're busy with your life and your occupation or your families, you know, unfortunately, you just don't pay that much attention. And he would talk about going over there to Belgium. Uh, actually, before he visited, he visited some of these people before the memorial was ever uh, erected. Mm -hmm. And he would talk about uh, visiting the, the Gadins. Uh, Andre and, and Jeanette, uh, they became, and my mother went with him, and yeah, he, 
he talked about him and but and also Nellie Tilcan, uh, the wife of the customs officer Paul Tilcan, who came and take them on the took him on a tandem bicycle to take him to a separate, separate location. And actually, Paul Tilcan, he was arrested a few months after he helped my dad. Uh, he was tortured, uh, sent to prison, and narrowly escaped being executed. But because of the beatings he took on his head, he developed a brain tumor, and he died at age 50. You know, there's so many casualties of, of the war that just weren't, you know, they didn't die just in the fighting, but, you know, kind of uh, adjacent to that or ancillary to that. Uh, a few of our, our viewers have uh, chimed in uh, tonight. Uh, Henry Kyle says, uh, good evening. Uh, and uh, he says, your dad and his uh, Flying Fortress crew will always be true American heroes uh, to him, uh, part of the greatest generation. And uh, thank you for, for sharing the story tonight. Um, yeah. Is there any interest in having this story made into a, a movie, you know, similar to, I mean, we just saw a Devotion come on the big screen uh, in November. Is any uh, screenwriters been uh, been knocking on your door and, and asking to make this into a movie? Well, I've had some feelers and and and, and so forth, but uh, nothing's come to fruition yet. Um, I will say I was I was at the Eighth Air Force Historical Society reunion uh, in D.C. last year. I'm on the board of directors, and a film crew from uh, the Smithsonian came in to interview some vets, and uh, they asked me if I wanted to be interviewed, and I said, yeah. So they actually have a series on the Smithsonian TV channel called Air Warriors. Okay. And I and the shot down story is going to be an episode on Air Warriors. So maybe that'll get some traction and draw some, some uh, uh, attention because a lot of people who read the book says it should be made into a movie. And so who knows, maybe one day it will. <laughs> uh, was the uh, was the wreckage of your dad's B-17 uh located and, and salvaged or was it just scrapped um no and un unfortunately uh the germans cordoned off the area area and at that time yeah they, in the war they were really hurting for metal so they salvaged all the metal uh the plane and they sent it all back to to germany uh so it i've on one of my trips to, uh, to Belgium, this Belgian man who's a collector, and I went to his home and he has an amazing collection of memorabilia, but he said he had pieces of my dad's plane and I was beside myself. And so he went over there and he sh showed me these, you know, kind of a wing tip and some other pieces. And he actually gave me some. And I thought, oh, I have pieces of my dad's plane. But then on further examination, I think it turned out to be a uh, British uh, uh, plane, uh, not a Lancaster, but uh, I, I forget. So I was pretty disappointed about that. Uh, this, some farmer was told, you know, they took it to made a sure. roof for his chicken coop. But, so, but now I, I, I guess nothing's left of it. Uh, okay. there's a, Is the how's how do people get a, a hold of the uh, two questions here? How can they get a hold of a copy of the book, and uh, can it be arranged to get a signed copy of the book? Definitely, uh, most people get the book off Amazon. Uh, again, shot down the true story of Pilot Howard and the crew of the B-17 Susan Ruth. Uh, but if anyone wants if anyone wants an autographed book, they can go to my website, stevesnyderauthor.com. Snyder, S-N-Y-D-E-R, Steve Snyder, author.com, and you can get an autograph, autographed hard copy. And there's a lot of historical information uh, on my website. It's just not about my book. There's interviews with veterans, uh, links to all sorts of different videos and archival footage. So uh, it's really a resource uh, site as well. Great. Um, and I know a lot of folks who are watching tonight uh, may have a father, a relative, uncle, something, grandfather uh, that was that was in the war, um, you know, also served on B-17s in the European theater. Do you have any advice for them on how to do research to uncover their relative story? Well, there are a lot of links to research sites that are on my website they can go to. Uh, but I've helped people out all the time and I'm glad to help out anybody if they want to send me an email, which is just Steve at stevesnyderauthor.com. 
<laughs> and I would be glad to uh, help you out. And uh, if I can't help you out personally, I can get you in contact to other bomb groups or, or sites that can help you out and a good chance that you'll be able to find some information about your vet. Is it just along that same line? Is it easier these days to to find that information, the research uh, being available on the internet, and are there more records that are being uncovered as we as we move along in history? Oh, definitely. Without the internet, I couldn't yeah. have done what what I did. Uh, I did have was fortunate. There were two Belgian men who were young boys during the war and became historians afterwards, and they interviewed all these Belgian people. Uh, about the events that took place involving my dad and crew. So they gave me a ton of information. So, you know, th that's not available to most people. You know, they gave me pictures and uh, detailed first, pe first person accounts of what some of what I've shared with you. Um, but there is an uh, unbelievable amount of information on the internet, uh, especially, you know, about POWs, POW camps. Uh, resistance people, underground people, bomb group. It, it, it is amazing how much information is on the internet, but you have to, it takes time. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're diligent and uh, persevere, you can find it. Great. Well, Steve, any final thoughts before we wrap up tonight? Well, I just uh, am thankful that I could be on again and uh, uh, share this with you. I, I have a passion, uh, you know, not only for my dad and his crew, but also for the entire 8th Air Force. Uh, we can never forget the sacrifice of those brave men. And it's my duty to, to, to keep that memory alive uh, of all the bomb groups, all the airmen in the 8th Air Force, and really all the guys who fought in World War II. Uh, next year, it's gonna be 80 years. I'll make, make another trip to Belgium on the 80th anniversary. It's a long time ago. And World War II is fading in people's memories, and we we just cannot let that happen. All right, Steve, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I said it at the top of the broadcast. I'll say it again. If you haven't read the book, you need to go <laughs> and get a copy of it. Read the book. Uh, you, you can get it on Kindle, and it, you can read it that way, but uh, I definitely recommend the, uh, the hard copy because it's got uh, just a ton of uh, pictures that uh, that are not on the electronic version that uh, continue to flesh out the story and and again steve thank you so very much for uh, for sharing not only the the story of of your father and and the crew of susan ruth but also uh, sharing your little travelogue going back to uh, to see what some of those locations look like uh, today we really every appreciate single it. time i go to your uh, belgium i find a little something new about the story it's amazing all right well maybe next year after you you go to the 80th anniversary uh, Remembrance, so uh, we can we can get together again and find out what you learned on this trip. Okay, deal. All <laughs> right, thank you, Steve, and thank you everyone for uh, joining us tonight. Again, don't forget to click that like, uh, subscribe, uh, or follow button so we can let you know about any of our future shows. And as always, if you have any ideas for a topic you'd like to hear more about, send Leah Black an email at media at cafhq.org. Again, thank you to uh, Steve Snyder for spending some time with us tonight. And until next time, from the Commemorative Air Force, I'm Steve Bose. Have a good night.